Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, so today we're going to cover a new uh, section in this topic. It's section 20.3 and it's called Amino Acids. Some of you may be familiar with um, this uh, with this molecule already. Okay, so amino acid contains the amino group which is NH2, and then it also has the acidic group, which is the COOH. Okay, so the general, general structure of the um, amino acid is given, but I like to draw it like this. Okay, so there will be a carbon center in the middle, and then um, there is an NH2, which is the amine group, and then on the other side, there is a the acid group, which is the carboxylic acid group. Okay, and then uh, there are two more uh, two more bonds um, on this uh, central carbon. Uh, it doesn't matter where you put um, your hydrogen top or below. Um, so there is a hydrogen, and there is another. Uh, the the other bond the the fourth bond is called the side chain or the side group okay and it is um, uh, represented by R now please don't get confused that um, the R group it's called the R group uh, usually we use um, R to represent alkyl but this time we call it the R group or the uh, side chain of the amino acid okay so this R group can be found in your uh, data booklet, unlike bio. You don't have to memorize the R group. The R group will be given. I'll show you um, shortly. But what I do want to emphasize is when you uh, draw out your amino acids, as you can see, these two molecules are the same, but it's drawn out differently. Okay, I like to draw the NCC carbon in a straight line or the word that I'm going to use along the backbone okay it is the backbone of later on you will see dipeptide polypeptide and etc okay so you want to arrange the NCC in a straight line that is your principal chain or that's your backbone okay so uh, the diagram on the right is showing you the simplest amino acid where your R group is a hydrogen okay so you can see there is an amine group amino group there is an acid there is a hydrogen and then your r group is it happens to be hydrogen and this is called uh glycine okay so um the special name for this amino acid is glycine but if we name it based on the um nomenclature rules this is called amino ethanoic acid okay because there are two carbon therefore it's ethanoic acid but because there's an amine group it's called amino ethanoic acid there is also no specific rule to draw your nitrogen and terminal or your amine group on the left side and then your c terminal which is your um, acid group on the right side there's no uh, specific rules yet okay so sometimes um, textbooks may refer to this uh, this amine group as the N terminal, and then the, the carbon of the COOH as the uh, C terminal. Okay, moving on. So this is some um, this is the uh, table that you are given in the data booklet. So they give you the general structure of a carboxylic acid where that carbon is attached to hydrogen. NH2 and COOH. So it's amino acid uh, and the R group. So this R group can be this one of this um, one of the listed uh, groups. Okay. So sometimes called side chain, sometimes called R group. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, glycine, as you know here, GLY, um, the one letter symbol is G is when your R is a hydrogen. Okay, so let's have a look at the second simplest um, amino acid, which is alanine. Okay, now to draw alanine, as I said, 
I like to draw my um, amino acid in a way that this NCC bond is arranged in a straight line. Okay, so that's my amino group. That's my hydrogen. This is my acid. And my R group is a CH3. Okay. And this R group can change depending on uh, which amino acid you want to you want to look at. Okay. If we want to draw aspartic acid, this one, okay, H O C H two C O O H, then all you have to do is change that CH3 and draw it as CH2. You have to be careful with how you draw um, your structure, okay? You have to be, you have to do a little bit of thinking, right? See, I know it is written down as HO2CCH2. You don't connect the carbon, the this carbon to a hydrogen, obviously. It has to connect to the carbon and then, so this is your CH2, COOH, okay? So you can change again your R group. It can be as simple, it can be as complicated, but the most important thing is the easiest way to um, see your amino acid is to line up your amino and your acid in a straight line. And then your hydrogen will be top and bottom. Your hydrogen and your R group will be top and bottom, okay? Because obviously later on, things will get uh, complicated, especially if we look at um, polypeptide, dipeptide, tripeptide, and polypeptide, okay? So this is another R group, and this is phenylalanine, okay? This one, phenylalanine. So you see this hanging bond, that is telling you that uh, that is the connector, okay? But obviously, it doesn't connect to the hydrogen bond, it connects to the carbon bond usually. So you, it's, it's best for you to draw it out so you can see, you can visualize how the amino acids look like. Okay, so good for you, you don't have to memorize this because it will be given in your data booklet. Okay? Right, all amino acids except amino ethanoic acid contains a chiral center. So a chiral center is a carbon that has four different groups or four different atoms attached to it. Okay? So that means if it has a chiral center, it has a mirror, uh, it has an optical isomer. So each amino acid except amino ethanoic acid will exist in two forms, okay? Uh, which is the mirror images of, uh, of each other. So um, why amino ethanoic acid? If you look back, on the structure. This is an amino ethanoic acid. This carbon is attached to two hydrogens, so that's that doesn't count. It has to be all different bonds. Okay, so this is an example of an amino acid. So you have your amine, your acid, your hydrogen, and then there's your R. Okay, so all amino acids will be chiral or will have a chiral center except the amino ethanoic acid or what we call a glycine. So you would imagine all amino acids acid existing in two forms, okay? Um, you should already know how to draw uh, the, the mirror image or the optical isomer uh, when there is a chiral center, okay? Moving on, describe the acid-based properties of amino acids. Now, amino acid contains amine, it contains acid. You all know acid, I mean, carboxylic acid is acidic and amine is basic. So there are both acid and base properties in an amino acid, okay? So this, is, um, this brings us to the next new concept that you're going to look at, which is uh, Zwitter ions, okay? So amino acids, since there is a, a basic group and an acidic group in the amino acid, they undergo what we call an internal acid-base reaction, okay? So, um, I'll show you how this acid-base reaction uh, is happening later on, but basically, it's just about the movement of your protons, your H+. Okay? Um, when there is an internal acid-base reaction forming, uh, you will have a dipolar ion. Basically, you have um, two charge, okay? positive and negative charge. And this form is called the Zwitter ions. Usually a positive charge, you call it cation. A negative charge, you call it anion. But when you have both positive and negative charge in 
one molecule or in one compound, we call it a zeta ion, okay? So technically, the zeta ion, if you look at it, positive and negative, they cancel out. It is actually neutral, okay? But um, just the name uh, end with ions, okay? This means that there is an internal transfer of hydrogen ion from the COH group to the NH2 group to leave an ion with both a negative charge and a positive charge. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, we all know that acids will give away, okay, acid uh, give away its protons. The basic group, the base will accept proton. Okay, so this is based on bronsted lowry theory, acid as a proton donor and basis as a proton acceptor. Okay, so what happens is that this hydrogen from the acidic group will be transferred internally to the NH2 group. Okay, so there are a few things that you need to uh, draw here. The amine, the nitrogen in the amine group has a lone pair, which enables it to accept the H+. Plus. Okay, so uh, what happens here? I want to draw it out, actually. Do I have space? Um, let's see. I will draw it out. Okay. So, amino acid CH, COOH. Hold on. Okay. Um. Okay. So I am going to draw out the R at the moment. Um, it's just a general R because this works for every single amino acid. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what R. I should use a different color actually. Yeah. Um, I'll change my COOH as red. Which you can't really see much, but okay. So what happens is that the proton, the H plus from the carboxylic acid will go to the amino group, okay? So you will get uh, it is a reversible N H so there are three hydrogen attached to that nitrogen, but the nitrogen is also attached to a H and COO. Okay, so after the carboxylic acid has lost its H+, plus, it becomes a COO minus, and after the nitrogen accepts the H+, plus, it becomes positive. Okay, so this is basically, I hope you can see, you can compare, where is it? You can compare this structure and this, okay? It's the same thing. So uh, this product is called the Zwitta ion because you have a positive charge here and a negative charge here. But please, uh, I hope you can see that uh, the proton transfer um, clearly, okay? So this happens. Um, it's a reversible process, okay? They can, they can uh, move the proton back and forth, okay? But either way, either form, whether it's in the, in the original form or the zeta ion form, both of these molecules are neutral, okay? It has no charge. Here, uh, on the left side, you definitely don't have charges, but um, you can see the amine group in its original form and the carboxylic acid in its original form. Okay. Um, in the zeta ion, you can see that there is a positive charge in the amine, uh, amine site of the uh, molecule, and then you can see a negative charge on the carboxylic uh, site of the molecule. Okay. Um, both of these positive and negative will cancel out anyway, so it really is just a neutral uh, molecule. So it doesn't matter which form you use, the, the one on the left or the one on the right, which is zeta ion, okay? But obviously zeta ion is when you 
draw it like this, okay? You can't call this molecule on the left a zeta ion. So when it comes to explanation or when it comes to answering your questions, you can choose whichever uh, form that you like, okay? Um, so this zeta ion is basically the, the common form or the default form of an amino acid, okay? They also, even in solid state or liquid state, you can still get a, a zeta ion, right? But um, your main takeaway from this is that the, the zeta ion has, uh, overall, it has no electrical charge. It is not charged, okay? Right, next, we look at the properties of the amino acids. Amino acids are high melting point crystal, crystalline solids. This is because of the strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the dipolar ions uh, that account for the high melting points. Okay, so as I said, zeta ion is the default um, form of amino acids. So one amino acid and another amino acid molecule will have an ionic um, ionic attraction, okay, because of these ions. That's why strong electrostatic force, electrostatic force of attraction, okay. Um, they don't call it a, an ionic bond, but because uh, this zeta ion can change back to the original form, so they just say it's a dipolar ions, okay. Um, so high melting points of amino acids. Secondly, the second properties that we want to look at is the solubility, okay? So because it is charged, we know that it can interact with water. So amino acids are soluble in water due to the ion-dipole interaction. Basically, the ions of the zeta ion will attract the uh, H2O, okay? Depending, if you are a positive nitrogen, it will attract the oxygen of H2O. If you're a negative oxygen, it will attract the slightly positive hydrogen in water, okay? So that's why it says ion dipole. The dipole is actually referring to water, as you know, because hydrogen is attached to uh, one of the highly electronegative elements, okay? The ion is from the zeta ion, which is the positive and the negative charge. Okay, uh, so it is soluble in water, but not soluble in nonpolar solvents. So only soluble in polar solvents. A solution of amino acids contains zeta ions that have both acidic and basic properties, as you would imagine. Okay? Because there is the amine group, there's a, there's a carboxylic acid group, so amino acids can have both properties. And when a molecule can act as a base or an acid, we call this amphoteric. Okay. Right. Next. Uh, amino acids can act as buffer solutions. That is, they will resist changes in pH when small amounts of acid or alkali are added. Okay, so you've already learned buffer solution in topic acids and bases. I don't remember the topic number, but what buffer solution does is that it will try to maintain the pH by resisting okay or by uh using up any additional h plus or additional oh minus okay so if you were not a fan of buffer in the the, the that topic that we did then you can't run away because in this topic you also have to explain how amino acid access buffer okay so when it comes to explaining amino acids as buffer, as you can see, we're going to use the zeta ion form, okay, which is this form, right? It is not, I mean, it's the same thing, same idea if you were to use this form, but they like to use the zeta ion form, okay? So you just have to get used to it, right? So I will use the blank space on the side to show, um, to draw out the bonds, okay? So this is your zeta ion. And, uh, let me see. Okay. Um, and then you have your hydrogen on top and your R at the bottom and your C double bond O minus, okay? And then say you are in an alkalized 
uh, solution slightly um, high uh, pH only slightly okay because if you increase if you add in a lot of um, hydroxides uh, then the buffer solution cannot do uh, cannot resist the change it will definitely change okay so this only happens when you add small amounts so OH minus is imagine the additional okay the additional uh, OH minus that can cause the change to my pH value. So how is this Zwitter ion acting? I messed up my positive charge on the nitrogen. How is my Zwitter ion going to sweep up, okay, going to use up this additional OH minus, okay? So if you are very good with your um, proton transfer and you can see it immediately, then this explanation is easy for you. Once you know the equation, then you can just write it in words. Even sometimes they don't even require you to explain it in words. Just write down the equation. Okay. Now let's have a look. OH minus. Okay. OH minus is a base. And uh, the only person that can react with this OH minus is the one that has uh, the one that is acting as an acid, okay? The one that is acting as an acid is the one that has a H plus to give away, okay? I know COO minus is the acid, but COO minus, I mean, COO H is the minus, but COO minus doesn't have H plus to give away, okay? If you look at the structure, this H plus can be given away to OH minus. When H plus reacts with OH minus, it becomes water, okay? So you have to, be familiar with this uh, proton transfer and then the charge and etc. So I will draw this. H, this H plus, okay, will the NH3 plus, the amine group, will use up or clean up the additional OH minus, okay? So the blue hydrogen will combine with the OH minus to form a neutral H2O. And then your zeta ion now becomes this, okay? So you no longer have three hydrogen, you have two hydrogen and you lost H plus. That means you no longer have the positive charge, okay? C double bond O, O minus. So you can see that initially you start with a Zwitter ion that is neutral because of the positive and the negative charge and then after it acts as a buffer solution it has a negative charge. It is now negatively charged. It is an anion. Okay, Water when you add H plus and OH minus they, it will form a neutral compound. Okay, so let's have a look at the explanation. If you increase the pH of a solution of an amino acid by adding hydroxide ions, the hydrogen ion is removed from the NH3 plus group. Okay, some students will argue, why is it coming from the amine? Now, amine as a base is when it is NH2 plus, uh, sorry, NH2 only. When it is an NH3 plus, this is, it, this is considered as an ammonium. Ion. And as we know, ammonium ion is a conjugate acid. So it can give away its H+. Also, if you imagine this, COO minus, there's no hydrogen ions to give away. Okay, so it cannot act as an acid. COOH is an acid. COO minus is a conjugate base. Okay, so uh, in basic solution, the amino acid acts as an acid, okay, and reacts with the base to form a salt. So this is your salt, right? Depending on what your uh, alkali is. If this is, uh, if you use a sodium hydroxide, then you would get this sodium salt. Um, so the equation is given here. Basically, it's the same um, thing as what I have drawn here. Okay, it's just um, I think there is a missing arrow here. Should be arrow. Okay. Um, therefore, at high pH, when you increase the pH of a solution, look at the product. Okay, water is neutral. This is neutral. This is negatively charged. This is uh, negatively charged. This is neutral. Okay. So, at high pH, among a more amino acid exists as an anion. 
okay? So because it is an anion, it will be attracted to the anode when a potential is applied, okay? This is, uh, why do we talk about uh, potential? Uh, because later on, this will be useful for the next section, which is electrophoresis, okay? But the idea is that at high pH, the amino acid is no longer neutral. It becomes an anion, okay, because of this reaction, right? Next one. What happens if it is now in a low pH? Okay, you have an acid. So I'm going to draw, again, starting with the new, I will draw it as a zeta ion, and H3 plus, okay, then on the middle carbon, Okay, always, if you cannot see it, I suggest you to highlight your middle carbon. That's your middle, central, central carbon. And then you have an R group, okay? Then you have an additional H plus, okay? So this H plus, there's only two options. Is it the NH3 plus that you go, that's going to react with the H plus or is it the COO minus, okay? You are only looking at this two functional group and nothing else. Do not look at the hydrogen above the central carbon. Do not look at the R group below the central carbon, okay? At least not for now. So obviously the nitrogen cannot accept the H plus anymore, okay? So what happens? the carboxylic acid will pick up the H plus. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's try to draw that. Um, so you have your NH3 stays as it is because you haven't done anything to it. There's your central carbon with your hydrogen and your R group. And then you form a COO. Now that you have picked up a hydrogen, it now becomes COOH. Okay, uh, negative and positive combine to become neutral. So this part is no longer charged. So overall, if you look at the overall molecule of the amino acids at low pH, which is in an acidic condition, you have a positive charge. So amino acid is a cation at low pH and cation will be attracted to the cathode. Right, so um, it's easy to see if you understand um, the proton transfer. Okay, so the explanation is just the same. Um, so this is uh, how they have summarized um, that at low pH, acidic, okay, at an acidic uh, pH, your amino acid will exist as a cation or a positive ion. So this is what we were looking at just now. Okay, at high pH, which is uh, when you have extra OH minus, your amino acid will appear as a negative ion, okay, which is this line. Right? At neutral pH, your amino acid will exist as zwitter ion or a neutral, um, neutral molecule. Okay? There is still charge positive and negative, but they cancel out. Okay? So this form is reversible. Amino acid can be zeta ion, can be negative ion, can be positive ion, depending on the conditions of the pH. Okay. Right, next is the peptide bonds. Okay, so this is the bond that uh, most of you biologists are more familiar with. Okay, so describe the formation of the peptide bonds between amino acids to give di and tri peptides. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, amino acid molecules can react with each other, acidic group and a basic group. So you can imagine acid and base can react with each other. Uh, when two amino acids react together, a dipeptide is formed. Okay, so let's have a look. How is a dipeptide formed? So by choosing the, the, the two of the simplest am, uh, amino acid, glyce which makes your R group a hydrogen, and then alanine, which makes your R group a methyl, okay, CH3. So I'm just going to label this. This is your R group. And then just R group, okay. Everything else is the same, if you notice, if you can see. Carbon attached to hydrogen, amine group, and acid group. 
Okay. Um, so glycine and al alanine can combine together with the elimination of a molecule of water to produce a dipeptide. So this reaction is called a condensation reaction. A small molecule is eliminated when reaction, reactant molecules join together. Okay. It is possible for this to happen in one of two different ways, so might get two different dipeptides. Right. Let's have a look. So there are two possible... Hold on. Okay, so there are two possible ways of um, forming a dipeptide when you start with glycine and alanine, okay? So basically, what happens, it is a condensation reaction, okay? Condensation reaction. So that means, uh, the two molecules will form one molecule and in the process you will lose water or sometimes you will lose a small molecule but in this case it's water okay so remember the acid group so looking at the first uh, possible uh, reaction this is the acid group of glycine okay and then this is the amino group of alanine okay so it has to be acid and base, cannot be acid-acid combination, right? So what happens is that um, you will lose the OH group from the acid and then you will lose the H group from the amine, right? When losing this, you will give out H2O and the bond that is newly formed is the carbon-nitrogen bond. So again, this is nothing new. This is similar like the formation of amide, except that the formation of amide is uh, you react acyl chloride with an amine. But it's the same thing. Carboxylic acid, acyl chloride is the active form, uh, the more reactive form of carboxylic acid. Okay, so the new bond form is that C single bond N. Okay, um, and then, okay, now that's the first combination. Glycine here, we use the C terminal. I call it the C terminal because it's uh, the carboxylic acid group. And then the alanine is the N terminal. Okay, now that's the first possible reaction. The second possible reaction is now we use the N terminal of glycine and the C terminal of alanine. So you have two possible, can you see this? C terminal of glycine with N terminal of alanine, but the next possible uh, reaction is N terminal of glycine and the C terminal of alanine, okay? So they are opposite to each other if you compare these two, right? And yes, they will give you different products, okay? Same thing, you lose OH from the alanine, uh, here, you lose the H from the alanine, right? So it's totally different, okay? And then in glycine, you lose the hydrogen. In the above glycine, you lose the OH, which is the in the C terminal, okay? So this is the two possible products when you react glycine and alanine uh, to form a dipeptide, okay? This bond, C... O and H is an amide bond or what we call a peptide link. Usually, uh, we use the word peptide if the starting material is an amino acid. Okay, if the starting material is not amino acid, we just call it an amide bond. But of course, it is not a problem if you call it an amide bond in chemistry, but not sure um, for bio if they accept it or not. Okay, so you have to check with them. So you can imagine even using two amino acids you have two possible products okay if you use three amino acids you even you have more possible combination okay n terminal c terminal and etc okay so you will you will try out the, the combination um, when you do uh, exercise or questions later on okay so the next example is the tripeptide Okay, if a tripeptide, that means there are three amino acids joined together. So this time it is general. Okay, now um, I forgot to mention that uh, why do I like to draw my NCC in a straight line? It's because it's easy to see when you draw a, 
uh, polypeptide later on. Okay, if you don't, then it will you will get easily confused. Okay, like for example, this this um, example is a tripeptide. You see that the amine is here, and then that's your central carbon, and then this is the carbon of your carboxylic acid. They're all in a straight line. Okay, you put everything else above and below the backbone or below the principal chain. Okay, same thing. NCC, NCC, okay, because it is easy. Why do I say this? Because the R group, it will complicate things. It will make you confuse, especially when you want to form a um, polymer later on. So this one is a tripeptide. You know that this is not the only possible uh, answer, but then at the moment, I don't know what the tripeptide is. So I'm just going to show you the general way of uh, drawing a tripeptide. Okay, so you have one amino acid one, amino acid two, amino acid three. Uh, it's a general one, R1, R2, R3. We don't know what R is yet. But what you do know is that when a tripeptide is formed, it must always be the combination of the carboxylic acid and the amine uh, terminal, okay? C and N terminal, the other side, C and N terminal as well, okay? So, uh, as usual, you lose the OH from the carboxylic acid and then you lose the hydrogen from the amine group, you form water, and the amide bond is the C double bond O and H, okay? But the new bond form is the C. That C single bond N. Okay, and then in your products, you can see that your NCC, NCC, NCC is nicely arranged in a straight line. Okay, and you form two molecules of water because that's the number of water that you have lost when combining three amino acids together. Okay, when you want to add more amino acids, you can imagine this NH2 can react with the COOH of another. Uh, molecule and etc. Okay. So if many amino acids are joined together, as in a protein chain, uh, it is called a polypeptide. Okay. If two amino acids dipeptide, three tripeptide, many polypeptide. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, proteins are made up of peptide chains and may contain over 100,000 amino acids. They have a very high molecular mass and are more complex in structure than polypeptides. Okay, uh, we'll, talk, we'll look at proteins in the next topic. Proteins could be hydrolyzed into its constituent amino acids by refluxing it with aqueous sodium hydroxide or uh, acid. So um, polypeptide, if you want... So this is showing you the formation of the amide bond. If you want to break the amide bond, this is called the hydrolysis. And uh, recently we've looked at the hydrolysis of the amide bond, right? Acid hydrolysis and base hydrolysis. So that is exactly the same, okay? C hydrolysis of amides. When you break down these amides, you will get three amino acids as you would start uh, earlier on. Okay. But depending on your, uh, what you're using, if it's a H+, remember your H+, will react with all your bases. Okay? So you probably would have the, um, so in acid, it will be, what did I say just now? Acid will be positive, okay? Positively charged. Um, okay. So this is what happens during hydrolysis, okay? It doesn't say if it's acid hydrolysis or um, base hydrolysis, but you know that during hydrolysis, it is the C single bond and broken. So if you didn't arrange your tripeptide in such a way that NCC is along the backbone, that it is difficult for you to see, okay? So this is your amino acid one, amino acid two, amino acid three. One, two, three, four, four. Okay, so this is a this is considered a polypeptide. There are four amino acids that make up this change. Sorry, uh, it is not a tripeptide as I said just now. Okay, right. So that is all for today. We have covered amino acids and uh, peptide bonds. You will see more of this um, peptide bonds in the next topic, which is uh, polymerization.
Okay, so um, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and thank you everyone. Bye.